Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let us now talk about another issue, a very important and vital issue in the chapter of Iman, which is the kafaratul yameen, the kafara of the oath, if you do not keep your oath. The main evidence for the kafara of the yameen is the ayah in Surah Al-Ma'idah. Allah says, لا يؤاخذكم الله بلغو في أيمانكم ولكن يؤاخذكم بما عقدتم الأيمان Allah does not punish you for your unintentional oaths, but he does take you to account for your deliberate oaths. فَكَفَّارَتُهُ إِطْعَامُ عَشَرَةِ مَسَاكِينَ مِنْ أَوْسَطِ مَا تُطْعِمُونَ أَهْلِكُمْ أَوْ كِسْوَتُهُمْ أَوْ تَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةً فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامٍ ذَلِكَ كَفَّارَةُ أَيْمَانِكُمْ إِذَا حَلَفْتُمْ وَاحْفَظُوا أَيْمَانَكُمْ كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ آيَاتِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ so its kafara or its atonement is that you feed 10 poor people from the average of what you feed your family or you clothe these 10 poor people or you free a servant and whoever cannot afford that then he fasts three days this is the atonement for your oaths when you have sworn and guard your oaths thus does Allah make plain his signs that you may be grateful so if the conditions for the kafara are met, and remember we spoke about these conditions, then this is the kafara which applies. Remember, when you break this oath, you have to have done so alim, dhakir and mukhtar. You know that you're breaking the oath, as opposed to being ignorant about it. You must have remembered that you're breaking the oath, because sometimes you could break the oath forgetfully, and you must have chosen to do so, so nobody forced you. So as for feeding the poor people, then the poor person is the one who does not find enough to feed himself and his family for a period of one year. If you don't want to feed him, you have the choice to clothe him. Or you also have the choice to free a servant. If you cannot do the above three, then you fast three consecutive days. Here we give you a choice. We don't say that there is a priority list because you're doing this for yourself. And when you have a choice for yourself, then you can choose whichever one you want to do, unless we have some evidence otherwise. As for feeding the ten poor people, you can either give them the food, or you can invite them over to your place and serve them the food. So either you can serve them the cooked meal, or you can just give them the uncooked food, and they can cook it. So either way is possible. But the food must not be some sort of cheap food, it must be the average type of food which your family eats. As for the clothing, then anything which could be called clothing, then this would suffice. Because Allah leaves it in the absolute sense. Some people may say whatever covers them from their belly button to their knees, so their aura. However, this is not necessarily clothing because you could be living in a place in which just covering from the navel to the knees is not considered to be proper clothing. And it makes no difference whether the poor person is young or old, male or female, because the ayah leaves it absolute. When it comes to freeing the servant, the ayah also leaves it absolute, which would mean, therefore, that it could be a kafir servant or a Muslim servant. And this is the opinion of some scholars, that it could be either. They argue that if it is a Muslim servant, then Allah Jalla wa would have told us so, just like he does with the freeing of a servant with accidental killing. He says in Surah An-Nisa, وَإِنْ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمٍ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَهُمْ مِيثَاقٌ فَذِيَةٌ مُسَلَّمَةٌ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ وَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ مُؤْمِنَةٌ And if this person who has been killed is from a people, between you and them there is a peace covenant or treaty, then you must give the fidya to his family and also free a believing servant. So the word mu'mina is used. Likewise, he also says, وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا خَطَأً فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ مُؤْمِنَةٌ and whoever commits accidental killing, then he has to free a believing servant. So twice there in the ayah, he mentions believing servant, which means then that a believing servant is a condition, not just any servant. However, in the kafara of the zihar, and also the kafara of the yameen, he does not mention a believing servant. And they would say, it's not like the ruling is the same either. Sure, the zihar, the yameen, and the qatl al khata they all have freeing of a servant, but they're not exactly the same because the zihar, it also has the option to fast two consecutive lunar months, and if you cannot do so, to feed 60 poor people. But the qatl al-khata, the accidental murder, 
does not have this option. Yes, it has the option to fast two consecutive months, but not to feed 60 poor people. So there's a difference in ruling there. Likewise, with the Yameen, there is a difference because the Yameen has feeding the 10 poor people or clothing them, and it also has the option to fast three consecutive days, but the Qatl al Khata does not have this option. So they are two different rulings such that we can draw any analogy. Whereas in the ayah of the Qatr al Khata, he specifically mentions a believing servant three times. Once is when you kill a person whose life is sacrosanct in an Islamic state, then you have to offer the kafara in addition to the blood money, and the kafara is the freeing of a believing servant. If you kill a person from another state and this state is at peace with the Muslims, then you have to deliver the blood money and free the believing servant. If you kill another person from an enemy state, then there is no blood money you give, but you free a believing servant. As Allah says, فَإِنْ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمٍ عَدُوٍ لَكُمْ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ مُؤْمِنًا If he is from an enemy state and the killed or the victim is a mu'min, then you free a believing servant. So here you don't give the blood money. Then the blood money will go to the enemies of the Muslims. This state is at war with the Muslims. So look how Allah Jalla wa'ala takes great care in mentioning this three times in one ayah. But he does not mention it in the other ayat. It would show that in the other ayat, meaning in the Yameen and the Dhihar, it is not a condition to free a believing servant. Rather, even a kafir servant would do. They say if it was enough that one ayah would apply to all rulings, then in this ayah of the Qatl al khata Allah Jalla wa'ala would only needed to have mentioned the believing servant once and it would apply to everything. It would apply to Qatl al khata we could also apply it to the Yameen, also to the Zihar. Just once would be enough. But why does Allah mention it specifically three times? It would show that it is only a condition in the Qatl al khata not anywhere else. As for the other opinion, then they go by the well-known qaida that the mutlaq is carried on the muqayyad. So the qatl al khata is muqayyad and the other evidences of the yameen and the zihar, they are mutlaq. And if the ruling is the same, which in this case is freeing the servant, then we carry the mutlaq on the muqayyad. So we restrict the absolute verses or evidences. Hence, even for the zihar and the yameen, we would have to free a believing servant. We could also use rationale for both points of view. The first viewpoint would use the rationale, would say that you free a believing servant because the act of killing is far worse than the dhihar and the yameen or having intercourse with your wife during the daytime of Ramadan, which is why the condition is stricter. It must be a believing servant, whereas with the others, it doesn't have to be a believing servant. The second opinion would use their rationale. They would say, no, in all cases, it must be a believing servant because imagine freeing a kafir servant. What is likely to happen is that he's going to go and join up with his kuffar people. And remember, this kafir is only a servant because he was taken in as a prisoner of war, which means he was fighting against the Muslims. Now, if we were to free him, then he's likely to join up with his kafir buddies and launch a return attack against the Muslims. So why would we want to let the dangerous animal out of the cage? There's an external evidence which the proponents of the second opinion would bring. They would say, what about the hadith in Sahih Muslim in which a man struck his servant girl and he regretted it. And then the Prophet asked for the servant girl to be brought and he asked her, where is Allah? And she says, Fissama in the Highness. And he asked her, who am I? And she said, Rasulullah, you are the messenger of Allah. And then the Prophet uttered the words, A'tiqha fa'innaha mu'mina. Free her because she is a believer. Which means that if she is not a believer, then you don't free her. So the fact that she had iman, the Prophet linked it to the freedom. Or he made it lead to her freedom. So there you have it. These are the two opinions. They are both well argued and both supported by evidence and they both have some powerful scholarly backing. So practically, which one should we go for? In a case like this, whichever opinion you pick, there's always a real good chance that you could be wrong, because the other opinion is always going to be a good opinion. 
and this is an example of a very good difference of opinion amongst the scholars. So practically, in a case like this, we would go for the safer opinion. And the safer opinion is that you free a believing servant. Because if you were to free a non-believing servant, then it is still possible that the other side could accuse you of doing wrong. Whereas if you free a believing servant, nobody can accuse you of doing wrong. As for fasting the three days, then Allah Jalla wa'ala says that the one who is unable to do the first three choices, then he goes for the three days of fasting. Because Allah says, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامِ Whoever does not find this, meaning the first three options, then he fasts three days. Let us compare these kafarat. When it comes to the zihar and the intercourse with your wife during the daytime of Ramadan, then the kafara for these two is the same. It is to free a servant. If you cannot, then you fast two consecutive months. And if you cannot, then you feed 60 poor people. So the feeding the 60 poor people is very close to the number of days you fast. Because in the lunar month, two months is likely to be 60 days. So it's about proportionate. The feeding the poor and fasting the two months. So each day for one poor person, approximately. What about the fidya? If you shave off your head during the ihram, well we know that you fast three days or you can opt to feed six poor people half a sa'a each. So here you have feeding six poor people but fasting three days. So the number of days you fast is not in accordance with the number of people you would feed. So it's not a one-to-one -one ratio here, it's a two-to-one ratio. In the zuhar and the jama'a, you have a one-to-one -one ratio approximately. And in the yameen, you have feeding ten poor people but fasting three days. So here the ratio is just over one to three. So the ratios between these kafarat are different. So one might wonder why are these ratios different? The answer is we don't know. But it shows us that there are some hidden factors which are working behind the scenes which are giving us these different rulings which we do not know about. Otherwise, naturally, a person may be inclined to keeping the ratio consistent. So if it's one-to-one -one with the dhihar, then keep it one-to-one -one with all other types of kafarat of the same nature as well. That's what you would expect the average human to do. But the wisdom of the sharia is above the intellect of the normal man. Okay, so these three days of fasting, we say that they should be consecutive, even though it is not clear in the ayah that they must be consecutive. But the reason why we say it's consecutive is because this is how Abdullah ibn Mas'ud read the ayah. In certain places of the Qur'an, the reading of Ibn Mas'ud or his Qira'ah is slightly different to the one most people are familiar with. And it is permissible to take from his Qira'ah. And during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, people were reciting the Qur'an in different ways. Such that we have the famous example where Umar heard a man reciting Surat Al-Furqan in a different way to how he had heard from the Prophet and he grabbed him and took him to the Prophet and he said that this man is reciting the Surah in a different way to what I'm familiar with and the Prophet heard the Surah from both of these men and he said that you are both correct that the Quran has been sent down in seven different styles of recitation and it is all correct it is only after Uthman an, unified the Quran that we find one text and this is unified because the different versions were leading to a conflict amongst the people. So since the time that Uthman an, unified the Qur'an, we've had one version of the Qur'an only, and it has been unchanged. The styles of recitation are different, but ultimately the version is one. With regards to feeding the poor people, and who to give, and how many to give, and what to give, then we could divide it up into three categories. Number one, where Allah Jalla only tells us how much food to give, but He does not tell us how many people to give, such as the Zakat al Fitr. We have to give a sa of food to the poor people. So He's told us how much to give, one sa, but how many poor people to give, we don't know. So you could give your sa to one person, or you could give your sa to a hundred people. However, some scholars have said that if you're going to give your sa to many people, then you need to make sure that each poor person receives at least a mud of food. So this is a number which they have come up with just to ensure that each person does have something decent. The second category, he tells us how much to give and how many to give. Such as when you shave your head in the ihram, he tells us that you give half a sa'a, that's the amount, and how many do you give? Six poor people. 
so six poor people, half a sa each. The third category, where he just tells us how many people to give, but he does not tell us how much to give. And this will be like the kafara of the yameen, and of the dhihar, and of the jama' in Ramadan. So he says that we have to feed ten poor people from the average of what we feed our families. So he has not given us a specific amount as to how much to give, but he has given us a specific number, how many to give. So it's 10 in this case. For dhihar, it would be 60. But he does not give us a quantity of the amount of food. Okay, what about this issue? If he takes multiple oaths, for example, he says, Wallahi, I will not speak to Zaid, and Wallahi, I will not enter this house, and Wallahi, I will not go to the market. Three independent oaths. If he was to break all three of these oaths, does he just have to offer one kafara? Or three separate kafarat? Some scholars say it is one kafara if he breaks all of these oaths at one time. And they say this is similar to if a person breaks his wudu by going to the lavatory, by eating the camel meat and by sleeping. He does three things, so he just needs to offer one wudu and that would suffice. But the majority of the scholars say that as long as the oaths are different and he breaks each of these three oaths which are different, then he has to offer three kafarat. And this is the stronger opinion. And there's no analogy with the wudu because with the wudu, if he goes to the lavatory, then he has broken the wudu. So if he then eats camel's meat afterwards, he has not broken the wudu because he didn't have any wudu in the first place. It is already broken. And this issue of the yameen is not the same thing whatsoever. If he breaks one oath, the second and the third oaths still stand. It's not like they are also broken. So three different oaths would mean three different gafarat. However, if he takes three oaths and they are pertaining to the same thing, so for example he says, Wallahi, I will not speak to Zaid. Then he says after a little while, Wallahi, I will not speak to Zaid. Then he says after a little while, Wallahi, I will not speak to Zaid. So he's taken three oaths, but they are about the same thing. So now if he does speak to Zaid, then he just offers one gafara because the oath was pertaining to the same thing or the same action. It was not three different oaths. What if he takes one oath which contains, let's say, three different actions? For example, he's told to go to somebody's wedding party, but he does not want to go. Maybe he has some friction with that person. And so he says, Wallahi, I will not go to his wedding party, nor eat his food from it, nor congratulate him. So the oath which he has taken is one oath, but it contains three different actions. Now, if he breaks all three of these actions, he just has to offer one kafara, not three different kafarat. And the reason for this is because the oath is one and the same, even if it contains three different actions. As for if he takes three different oaths about three different things, then yes, there are three different kafarat which he has to offer. And like we said before, if he takes three different independent oaths, but they are about the same action, then he just needs to offer one kafara. Let us take a look at this next hadith, 1186. From Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, Your oath is pertaining to what will make your companion believe you. And in another wording, the oath is upon the intention of the one who is asking you to take the oath. Muslim reported it. You'll remember previously, we gave the four phases. The intention, the niyyah, of the one taking the oath. The sabab, the ta'yeen, when he specifies a particular item. Or what the word means in the linguistic sense, or the shara'i sense, or the urfi, or the customary sense. However, in this hadith, we have a situation where we have a court case on our hand. And the person opposing you asks you to take an oath so that you can establish your case because he does not believe you. This is why we are in the court. What this hadith is telling us is that you are not allowed to try any funny business such that you say one thing outwardly, but inwardly you intend something quite the other. So, for example, person A lends £100 to the wakil of person B. And person B has to obviously pay back person A, but he refuses to do so. So in the court case, person A says to person B, take an oath that you don't owe me anything. And person B says that I take an oath that, Wallahi, I don't owe you anything which you lent me. 
but his intention is what you directly lent me, not what you lent my wakil. So obviously person B is trying to play games here. So this oath of person B is not taken on person B's intention because person B is intending what person A lent him directly. But we say that in a court case, the oath will be taken upon the intention of person A. This is the meaning of the hadith. Otherwise, people could take an oath and they could equivocate and play games. So like the narration says, we go by the intention of the mustahlif, the one who asks you or demands the oath from you. We do not go by your intention because normally we would go by your intention. But in this scenario, we are dealing with a court case in which other people's rights are at stake. Al-Imam al-Nawawi says that if somebody asks you to take an oath, but it is not a court situation, so the Qadi is not involved, then you would be allowed to make the equivocation. So you say one thing, but you intend something quite the other. Although, you could counter-argue and say that the Hadith is general. It is not specific to the Qadi. So, in accordance with the generality of the Hadith, you may argue that anyone who asks you to take an oath, even if it is not a court situation, then the oath would be upon the intention of the one who demands the oath from you. So upon this then we would have a difference of opinion. But the point is that the hadith is general. As for if nobody demands an oath from you, then it would be down to your intention like we discussed before. Hadith 1187 From Abdurrahman ibn Samura, the Prophet said, وَإِذَا حَلَفْتَ عَلَى يَمِينٍ فَرَأَيْتَ غَيْرَهَا خَيْرًا مِنْهَا فَكَفِّرْ عَنْ يَمِينِكَ وَأْتِ الَّذِي هُوَ خَيْرٌ مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet said, when you take an oath and then you see something better than the oath which you have taken, then you expiate your oath and you do that which is better. مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ And in a wording of Al-Bukhari, فَأْتِ الَّذِي هُوَ خَيْرٌ وَكَفِّرْ عَنْ يَمِينِكَ Then do that which is better and make the kafara for the oath. And in a wording of Abu Dawood, فَكَفِّرْ عَنْ يَمِينِكَ he says, then you expiate for the oath, and then you do that which is better. This version is Sahih. This hadith is part of a longer hadith which talks about the fact that the Prophet is ordering Abdullah ibn Samura not to ask for leadership, meaning being a political leader. So you're not allowed to ask to be the Khalifa, for example. However, when it comes to being an imam of a masjid, for example, which is also a leadership type of position, or if it is a leadership position, but it is not the ultimate leader, the khalifa, so it is like a minister, then this you are allowed to ask for if you are worthy of it and nobody else is as worthy as you are. Because the point is with these positions, you need the best man for the job. And they would take their evidence from the hadith in which one of the sahabi asked the prophet to make him the imam of his people. And the Prophet said, okay, you are the Imam of your people and you must follow the weakest of them, meaning you must take the weakest of your followers to account so you don't lengthen the prayer too long, for example. And you do not appoint a Mu'addin who will charge for his Adhan. So we take then that this companion is asking to be Imam. But this is not the ultimate political ruler. Likewise, we have the story of Yusuf a.s. Yusuf a.s. did not ask to become the leader of Egypt. Rather, he asked to become the minister of the agriculture, if you like, to take care and preserve the food. So these are not positions of ultimate power, like a prime minister, or a president, or a king, or a khalifa. What he asked for is a position of power, but it's not the ultimate position of authority. So if you are capable of this, and you have the ability, and you're the best man for the job, then the ulama say you are allowed to ask for this position because otherwise it could go to somebody who is less qualified than you and will not do as good a job as you can. But the point about this hadith is pertaining to the oath taking. So for example, he takes an oath that he will not fast on Monday and we know to fast on Monday is recommended. We tell him it is better for you to fast on Monday. Therefore, why don't you break the oath and fast on Monday, and then expiate for breaking the oath. This would be better for you. But if he says that I take an oath by Allah that he will not pray with the Salat al-Jama'ah in the masjid, then he has taken an oath to do something which is haram, if he lives close enough to the masjid. 
So in this case we would say, no, it is obligatory upon you to break your oath and to offer the expiation because it is obligatory upon you to pray in the Salat al-Jama'ah. What if he takes an oath on something which is just simply permissible? For example, he says, Wallahi, I will not wear this qamis. Here we say, this is simply a permissible matter. Therefore, it is better for you to guard your oath and to not break it. The big question here is, which one does he begin with? Does he break the oath first and then offer the kafara? Or offer the kafara and then break the oath? Well, as you can see from the narrations, we have evidence for both. With the oath, we have a sabab for the kafara and we have a condition for the kafara to be obligatory. So notice the two concepts, the sabab or the cause for the kafara, and this is the oath. Then the second concept is the condition for the kafara to be wajib, and this is breaking the oath. Now, you are allowed to offer the kafara after the sabab and before the obligation. So the sabab is the oath, so you can offer the kafara after the oath. You cannot offer the kafara before the oath. So let's say, for example, you did offer the kafara before taking the oath. Let's say you fed 10 poor people and then you took the oath and then you broke it. You would have to offer another kafara because the kafara cannot come before the sabab. However, it can come after the sabab, but before the obligation. Remember when it becomes obligatory, it becomes obligatory when you break the oath. So as long as the kafara comes after the sabab, it's all well and good. The order is not important. So whether you offer the kafara then break the oath or break the oath then offer the kafara, both are permissible. But it's just a technical difference in the naming. If you offer the kafara before breaking the oath, this is called a tahilla. And if you offer the kafara after breaking the oath, then this is called the kafara. Hadith 1188 from Ibn Umar, the Prophet والسلام, said, Man halafa ala yameenin faqala insha'allahu fala himtha alayhi رواه أحمد والأربعة وصححه ابن حبان. From Ibn Umar the Prophet said, whoever takes an oath, but then he says insha Allah, then he does not break the oath. The hadith is sahih. You remember previously we said what the conditions are for the kafara to be obligatory. We said the person needs to be mukallaf, that he needs to intend the oath, that it needs to be pertaining to a future action which is possible to perform. He chooses to make this oath as opposed to being forced and he breaks this oath aliman, dhakiran and muhtaran. We spoke about this previously. But here we find another condition which removes the obligation of the kafara. If he says insha'Allah then there is no kafara upon him and he has not broken the oath. So we could add this as another condition. We could say that the extra condition is that he has not said insha'Allah for the kafara to be obligatory. So for example if he says Wallahi, I will wear this shirt tomorrow, insha'Allah. He has taken an oath on a future event. Now, if tomorrow he does not wear the shirt, has he broken the oath? The answer here would be no. Why? Because he said insha'Allah. And as the hadith says here, if he says insha'Allah, then he has not broken the oath. However, to this rule, the scholars say there are conditions. They mention three of them. Number one, that in saying insha'Allah, his intention should be that he links the action to the will of Allah. So he properly intends, insha'Allah. It's not just something that flows off the tongue. So in other words, he truly does intend leaving this action up to the will of Allah. So if Allah does will, it will happen. Otherwise, it will not. Because sometimes you could say, insha'Allah, without particularly meaning it. It just flows off the tongue. Condition number two, that this insha'Allah should be continuously joined to your oath. So it's not like you take the oath, then after 15 minutes you say insha'Allah. This is not acceptable because it's not continuously joined onto your oath. Because the break is too long. Unless the break is, let's say you're sneezing, or you have to yawn, or something like that, then that type of gap does not harm. And the third condition, he has to say it with the wording, not just in his heart. Hadith 1189 from Ibn Umar. He says that the oath of the Prophet would be لا ومقلب القلوب No, by the one who turns the hearts. Al-Bukhari reported it. 1190 from Abdullah ibn Amr. He says that a desert Arab came to the Prophet and he said O Messenger of Allah, what are the major sins? And the hadith is longer, so he mentioned the hadith and from it the Prophet replied al al ghamus The oath which dips you in. And he was asked, what is the al-yamin al-ghamus? The Prophet said, 
التي يقتطع بها مال امرئ مسلم وهو فيها كاذب أخرجه البخاري It is the oath in which you wrongfully take the wealth of a Muslim person whilst you are lying in this oath. Al-Bukhari reported it. We take from the first narration out of these two that the oath can be taken using the description of Allah because مقلب القلوب is not a name of Allah but it is a description. You could use other descriptions like ورب الكعبة by the Lord of the Kaaba because the companions used to say والكعبة by the Kaaba and this is shirk. So the Prophet ﷺ told them, rather you say, وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَةِ By the Lord of the Kaaba. So he gives them this halal alternative. Or you could say, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ By the one who has my soul in his hand. This was also a popular one which the Prophet would use. So all of these are permissible. As for the next hadith, it talks about الْيَمِينُ الغموس. We find that this type of oath is a major sin. Firstly, you take the oath by Allah and you are lying. So that's the first problem. And the second problem with this is that with this lie, you usurp or wrongfully appropriate the wealth of your Muslim brother. So it's a double sin. And ghamus means dipping you in because it dips you into sin and thereafter it completely dips you into the fire. As for taking an oath by Allah and lying in it, but not usurping the wealth of your Muslim brother, then some people have also called this al yamin al ghamus but it appears it is not. The ghamus, even though it is a sin, no doubt, but the yaminul ghamus is when you use this lying oath to take the wealth of your Muslim brother. So you can see it is far worse than just a simple lying oath. Many scholars say that the al yaminul ghamus is the yamin which you break and you don't offer the kafara. So this will dip you into the sin. And there is a narration from Ibn Mas'ud, his statement in Al Bayhaqi. He says we used to consider the al yaminul ghamus to be the yameen with no kafara. But the hadith here in this chapter tells us that the al yameen al ghamus is the lying oath which you use to take the wealth of your Muslim brother unlawfully. Hadith 1191 from Aisha radiallahu anha. She is commenting on the ayah of the Quran La fi Allah will not take you to account for your unintentional oaths, she explains it by saying that this is when a man says La wallahi wa bala wallahi No by Allah or of course by Allah. Al-Bukhari reported it. The tafsir of the Qur'an by a statement of a sahabi can be taken as evidence and this is obviously an example. So Aisha radiallahu anha is telling us here that this is the oath which simply flows off the tongue and you did not intend it. Some other scholars said that the laghul yameen, the futile yameen, or the futile oath, is the oath which somebody takes pertaining to a past event, which he deems to be the case, but it turns out to be other than what he thought it was. For example, if he said, Wallahi, Zayd arrived yesterday, and he thinks truly that Zayd did arrive yesterday, but then he finds out, oh, Zayd did not arrive yesterday. Then for some scholars, this is the laghul yameen, that Allah will not take you to account. And Ibn al-Mundir says that this opinion is the opinion of most of the scholars. Other scholars say that yes, this could be the laghu al but also what Aisha says, this is also the laghu al -yameen. But either way, we can be sure that you will not be punished for the laghu al -yameen. Can we apply the same principle to divorce? So if he says to his wife she is divorced, but he did not intend this, it is something that unintentionally flowed from the tongue, just like the oath could flow from the tongue. Then we would say, no, this is not a divorce, we would go by your intention. However, if the wife takes the husband to the court and she demands that she be divorced because he said so, then what would the Qadi do? The Qadi would have to go by what is apparent from the wording and he would have to adjudge it to be a divorce. Let's take the next hadith, 1192. From Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, Inna lillahi tis'atan wa tis'in asman, man ahsaha. دَخْلَ الْجَنَّةِ مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ Verily, Allah has 99 names. Whoever encompasses them will enter Jannah. مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ And in a version of a tirmidhi we are given a list of these 99 names, but this list is not authentic. It is mudraj. It has been added in by a narrator. So we are told in the hadith that he has 99 names. We are not told exactly what these names are. So they have been kept hidden from us so that we may strive to find out what they are. 
using the Quran and the Hadith. And it is for the same reason that the date of Laylatul Qadr every Ramadan is hidden from us so that we may strive and keep awake every night during the last 10 nights in order to attain the virtue of this night. And in the same way, the special time on Yawm al-Jum'ah in which your du'a is accepted, we are not told the exact moment so that we may strive and make du'a all throughout the day. The key word here in the hadith is the word ahsaha. Whoever makes ihsa of these names will enter Jannah. So what does this mean? Ihsa normally means when you completely count everything. But here it has a broad meaning. Firstly, it means the one who memorizes them and knows them. But also the one who seeks a closeness to Allah using these names. So in other words, he lives his life in accordance with the names of Allah. So for example, if he knows that one of the names of Allah is Al-Basir, the one who sees, or for example, As-Samir, the one who hears, then he's going to live his life in accordance with this. So he knows that Allah can see and hear everything he does and says. So he's going to watch what he does and he's going to watch what he says because he knows that he will be taken to account for his actions and his words. If he knows that Allah is Ghafoor, the one who forgives, then he's going to live his life seeking the forgiveness of Allah Jalla wa ala. If he knows that Allah is Al-Aziz, the one who is mighty or the one who is honored, then he's going to fear Allah and make sure he does not get into the bad books with Allah Jalla wa ala. How does this hadith relate to the chapter of a man or oath-taking? Well, like we said before, you are only allowed to take the oath by Allah or one of his names or attributes. So you're not allowed to use just any name which you think is the name of Allah and take an oath by it. Rather, you need to have evidence that this particular name is the name of Allah. And the evidence is in the Quran and the Sunnah. And as for taking an oath by other than Allah, then this is a form of shirk. And we know of the statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. He said that I should truthfully take an oath by other than Allah is worse than taking an oath falsely by Allah. This hadith seems to tell us that there are 99 names. However, we also have the authentic narration which tells us the dua for when you are worried or stressed. And it says, أَسْأَلُكَ بِكُلِّ اسْمٍ هُوَ لَكْ سَمَّيْتَ بِهِ نَفْسَكْ أَوْ أَنْزَلْتَهُ فِي كِتَابِكْ أَوْ عَلَّمْتَهُ أَحَدًا مِنْ خَلْقِكْ أَوْ اسْتَأْثَرْتَ بِهِ فِي عِلْمِ الْغَيْبِ عِنْدَكْ I ask you with every name which belongs to you, with which you have named yourself and sent down in your book or taught any one of your creation or kept with you hidden in the knowledge of the unseen and the du'a goes on but note where he says the name you have kept with you hidden in the knowledge of the unseen so it means that there are other names which Allah has which have not been revealed to us in the Quran or the Sunnah but this hadith of the chapter does not tell us that Allah only has 99 names rather it tells us that Anyone who encompasses these 99 names will enter Jannah. But that does not necessitate that he only has 99 names. So if somebody says, I have £100 for shopping, then this means that these £100 are for shopping. It does not mean that he only has £100. So as for those people who memorize the names of Allah, but they do not have Iman in the names of Allah, that these are in fact the names of Allah, or for example, they do not act in accordance with these names of Allah, then their memorization bears no fruit. Much like you memorizing the Qur'an without acting in accordance with the ayat that you have memorized. Like the Prophet spoke about the Khawarij, يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرْآنَ لَا يُجَاوِزُ حَنَاجِرَهُمْ They will recite the Qur'an, but it will not go past their throats. So the recitation is of no benefit and no use to them. So those names of Allah which denote His greatness, should fill the heart with the veneration of Allah Jalla wa ala. So Al-Kabir, Al-Muta'al, the one who is high, Al-Azim, the one who is great, this fills your heart with veneration. And when it comes to those names which denote Allah having great ability and honor and might, then they should fill the heart with fear, like Al-Aziz or Al-Qadir or Al-Qadir or Al-Jabbar, the one who overcomes forcefully. So the heart submits and lowers itself to Allah Jalla wa ala because of these names. But then when it comes to other names like Al-Barr, the one who does much good, or Al-Wadud, the loving, or Ar-Rahim, the merciful, then these types of names, 
will induce a desire in the heart. So you yearn for Allah Jalla wa ala and His mercy and His blessing. So we find that the different names of Allah Jalla wa ala ought to have differing effects on your heart. As for a kafir, the one who does not have any iman in the first place, then it does not matter which name he gets to know about, it will have no effect on his heart. Because his heart has been hardened. So knowing the meanings of the names and acting in accordance with them, this is what will enter you into Jannah. Hadith 1193 from Usama ibn Zayd that the Prophet said, Man suni'a ilayhi ma'roofan faqala li fa'ilihi jazakallahu khayran faqad ablagha fi thana' أخرجه التلمذي وصححه ابن حبان Whoever is done good to and then he says to the good doer meaning the one who did good to him may Allah reward you with goodness then he has considerably praised the good doer The hadith is sahih So this hadith is pertaining to thanking the one who does good to you Remember the rule is the one who does good to you you ought to do a similar good back to him but sometimes this may not be possible or practical Therefore, for you to at least say Jazakallahu Khairan is legislated. And if you did not say this, then that would be a blemish on your character. How is it that somebody is doing you a favor and you don't show any appreciation whatsoever? Clearly, this is not from good character by anyone's standards. And it does not matter whether this favor is a materialistic favor or not. So it may be non materialistic, it may just be a compliment. Either way, it is good being done to you. So this dua means may Allah reward you with good and this includes both the good in this world and in the hereafter. And if anyone does good to you then ultimately this good does come from Allah Jalla wa ala. And so the Muslim is consistently thanking Allah and Allah Jalla wa ala says لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ If you thank me I will increase you in good and if you are ungrateful then my punishment is severe. The immediate question pops out, what has this hadith got to do with the Yameen? Well, there does not appear to be any connection between this hadith and the topic of an oath. It is possible that the Sheikh was thinking of something else as he inserted this hadith in this chapter, and Allah knows best. Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one, state the expiation for breaking the oath. Question number two. In freeing a servant, must it be a Muslim servant? Debate and discuss this issue, looking at both sides of the argument. Question number three. If someone asks you to take an oath about a particular matter, is it permissible for you to equivocate and justify your answer with evidence?